and he'll deal with African American slavery and Native American slavery at the same time. I'm going to do that by focusing on a few thoughts around the question of Indian slavery, which have come up in my own work. That work is not so much about slavery as it is about the kinds of interactions, usually contested and in conditions of violence and duress, but also which occasion the exchange of knowledge, which took place between indigenous people, enslaved Africans, and colonizing Europeans in the Americas and in Southern Africa. These are just covers of the kinds of uh, natural histories, in other words, the colonial archive that I spend a lot of time looking at. So you get very old histories of the first European natural historian who goes to Barbados or to Jamaica or to Brazil or to Haiti. I want to spend a moment on this one, which is from Brazil. This is actually the first natural history of Brazil. You can see the European imagination working and how they see uh, the native Americans or the Tupi Namba people as they call themselves in Brazil. And the interesting thing about this, uh, this old first natural history of Brazil for me is that I'm always thinking about the knowledge of plants. In the, so the knowledge that African, enslaved Africans and in this case in Brazil, the enslaved Tupi Namba, because everywhere in Latin America, it's first the Native Americans who were enslaved. And then when that doesn't work in some kind of way, Africans are brought in. So the reason why this book is important, done by Willem Pizzo and George Margraff, is that it was done in the time when the Dutch briefly held Brazil. Now we know Brazil is a Portuguese colony, but in the 15, 1640s, the Dutch were holding Brazil and the governor, uh, Count Moritz of Nassau, thought it important to do scientific studies. So he brings over Willem Pizzo to look at questions of plants and the knowledge about plants. And in this time, we remember that the knowledge about plants is like knowing where gold and diamonds and oil are later on in history. So Pizzo does this book. And what do you find when you see the book is that the Tupinamba and the enslaved Africans are there on these early sugar plantations at the same time. And they're exchanging knowledge with each other. Most of the book is about what he calls the simples, which are the medicinal plants, the herbal medicines of the Tupinamba. But occasionally you find a page like this one that's shown there, where he reports that the Africans are teaching the Indians how, or the indigenous people, how to use particular plants. And so you begin to get a notion of the plants that the Africans managed to bring over or that were brought over in the slave ship, like sesame, eggplant, and okra. And you also get a sense of how the Tupinamba are teaching the enslaved Africans about some very important plants, usually maize, but also cassava, which is the bread of the Caribbean. It's the bread of the Tainos, it's the bread of the Brazilians. The terms that were being used by the Portuguese and the Dutch at this time were also interesting. They called the Tupinamba in the beginning when they enslaved them, Negros da Terra, the blacks of this land. And the ones who were coming in from Guinea and from Angola, and thus the first set, they are Negros de Guinea and Negros de Angola. It's an interesting use of the notion of color and slavery. And the picture on the lower right, what you see is, it looks like they're trying to depict Africans, but actually this is an early depiction of Tupinamba, who are enslaved and who are put to producing the bread, this bread called cassava or cassava, depends on which part of the Caribbean or Latin America you're in. And these were first enslaved Tupinamba who have to produce this bread. So for me, this is an interesting evidence of not just the enslavement, joint enslavement side by side of Native Americans and enslaved Africans, but also of the knowledge they exchanged and the knowledge and the wealth of knowledge that they bring to the colonizers. This picture is a picture in Africa of Angola, the city of Luanda, and at the same time that the Dutch are holding this part, this tip of Brazil as part of their um, at their empire, they're also briefly in charge of or colonizing the Ngola Kingdom. They never get quite to colonize the Congo Kingdom, but the Ngola Kingdom in Luanda. This is the oldest fort, one of the oldest forts on the coast of Africa. It's uh, San Miguel de Luanda, built in 1576. And the interesting thing is that when the Dutch, built by the Portuguese, when the Dutch take Luanda briefly in the 1640s, 
they bring over Tupi Namba masons, stone masons, sailors on the boats. And some of those Tupi Namba escape altogether. They melt into the kingdoms, what were then the kingdoms of Congo and Dongo. So one interesting research question for me is sort of like the disappeared Taino, where did these people go? And what would thinking about them teach us about slavery and relations among Africans and, and Native Americans with respect to slavery and not just slavery? This is a picture with which I'm sure it depicts things that most people in this region would be familiar with, which is uh, the massacre of the Pequod in 1937 in Connecticut. This is one of the beginnings of a massive deportation of Native American people from New England to the Caribbean. So it then posits another question, where did these people go? They go to everywhere in the Caribbean. They go to the Bahamas, they go to Barbados, they go to Jamaica. So when I was a child, probably like many of you who are at least my age or older, we were always taught the Indians, the Native Americans are largely disappeared. I have there a quote from Herman Melville, the book that we all had to read in school, Moby Dick, where he says, you know, the name of the boat, the ship is the Pequod, first of all, and we don't even know why it's the Pequod when we're reading it. But he says, you will no doubt remember the Pequod was the name of a celebrated tribe of Massachusetts Indians now extinct as the ancient Medes. So he's writing this in 1851, but these supposedly extinct people, many of them are not just still here in New England, but are also in the Caribbean. And in fact, one of the things that was most astonishing to me in trying to do the research of black people and Native Americans side by side in this question of slavery is an intra-American slave trade that went on in the Caribbean, a waterborne traffic, they didn't cross the Atlantic, but was going around in the Caribbean, was a very, very large flow of slavery. The estimate now is that over a period of 400 years, more than 2.5 million Native persons, many of them from New England, were in slavery in the Caribbean. This is besides the Taino who lived there. This is another set. And this saltwater trade expelled them all over the Caribbean to Little Bonaire and Curaçao, to the many small Lucayas, to Hispaniola and to Puerto Rico. In fact, one study done by Resendez, which is called The Other Slavery, is that in the period between 1670 and 1720, from the Carolinas, South Carolina in particular, more Indians were exported out of Charleston, South Carolina than Africans were imported into Charleston, South Carolina. So one of the chief things that I've been doing in trying to do research about botanical knowledge in the Caribbean is looking at this question of black people and Native Americans, or enslaved Africans and enslaved Native Americans living side by side during a period when we were told, at least when I was in school, that all these people had disappeared. So you get, for example, the famous work by um, Hans Sloan in Jamaica. And if you read the archive, if you read the original, which uh, many of these originals are in uh, Brown's JCB library, you get this understanding that these supposedly disappeared Indians and these enslaved Africans are actually living side by side for quite some time in many of the Caribbean countries. This is a quote just from Jamaica, from the Natural History of Jamaica done by one Hans Sloan, in which he talks over and over again about the Indians and the Negroes, the Indians and the Negroes, even Indian and Negro doctors, and the diseases that they were able to cure using plants that were natural to Jamaica. And deep inside the book, the Hans Sloan book, is an account of a Lucaya, which is the other name for the, for the Bahamas, a Lucaya couple enslaved in Hispaniola and how they tried to get away. And then they returned to slavery. So you have to ask yourself, um, we all learn in school about how Native Americans disappeared in the United States, supposedly, how they disappeared as well in the Caribbean, but they show up over and over again in these natural histories. 
So one of the things that also shows up in these old colonial histories is a question of Native American revolt, enslaved African revolt, and how afraid the colonists up and down the East Coast and down into the Caribbean were of this revolt. So in 1502, you get one of the earliest ones where the Spanish governor of Hispaniola asks the king of Spain. Essentially, he just says, please don't send me any more of these African slaves. Let's have a moratorium because they run away to the mountains of Hispaniola, which today is Haiti and the Dominican Republic, and they don't come back. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, they pair up with the Native Americans who are the Taino who are fleeing, and we don't know what's going on up in the mountains, but it's dangerous, so let's just have a moratorium. You move to 1676, and this is from a study done by um, Professor Linford. Yeah, where are you? I think he's here somewhere. <laughs> exactly. One of his early studies. Uh, because he continues to do this work. Dangerous designs, the 1676 Barbados Act to, prevent, to prohibit New England Indian slave importation. They were by now very, very afraid of these Native Americans who had revolted and who almost won the war in this region. And so several thousands of them are deported. And the, the governor in, down in Barbados says that, you know, he really doesn't want any more of these. Many of them are already there, but he says he really doesn't want any more of these because it's like a contagion to have them. These Native American uprisings that are taking place in Virginia and Maryland and New York, and now these people are deported or sold down into the Caribbean and causing trouble. This happens over and over again in the Caribbean. I have, the quote at the bottom is from a famous um, Caribbean poet and historian, Kamal Brathwaite, and he writes a poem about, just part of it, is about the Maroon Coast in Barbados, which many people think, oh, there weren't any Native Americans left there. And he writes about the ones that got away the ones that found a settlement somewhere on the coast, which they call the Maroon Coast of Barbados. And he talks about how they got away and how important it is that they found their freedom. So the reason why this is called Native, Native Revolt, Black Revolt and Colonial Fears is that this question of Native Americans and not yet African Americans, but enslaved Africans joining together in, revol in possible revolt was one of the biggest fears of colonial times. It might bring us a greater understanding of the historical phenomenon of Indian slavery in the Americas. I want to suggest that this could lead us not just to new histories of what my friends on the Bahian coast of Brazil call the people of the waters, but new works on the nature of rebellion and revolts for freedom and for sovereignty in the Americas, from the eastern woodlands to Barbados and Brazil and a different kind of critical triangulation of our knowledge about slavery in this old world, it's not a new world, in this old world and the Americas. In the early records, you see people classified by the names of their nations, and I mean Native American nations. As time goes on, you begin to see them classified as things like musty. And after a while, you begin to see those who have uh, who are mixed African and Native American get progressively classified out of the Native American part of their heritage. You begin to get a, you get a loss of people's names from the nations from which they come and they get classified as Indian and you get a progressive moving out of people who are part Native American, part African American into African American. So the time that, um, in the time that, um, that I was talking about, which is early, kind of an earlier colonial period, some of those names still would have been used, but when they get to the Caribbean is when they really get lost into just being called the Indians, because these are ex exported from the United States because of the rebellions and the revolts and sold into the Caribbean, where they practically disappear in some of the places that they were expelled to. And that's a different case from the Taino who always lived there. This is where, you know, this is where they were from. But the ones who were expelled from the United States, parts of the coast down, and they gradually kind of disappear into the population, intermarrying with, with um, enslaved Africans primarily in the case of the Caribbean. 
Uh, I think you have the clue when you say that uh, the names are begin to be made up and falsified. In the case of African enslaved Africans, a lot of times they, the classification comes out of the port by which they left Africa and come to the New World. It doesn't mean that those people are necessarily from that area. They could be in the general hinterland and then get that name and come. In the case of Native Americans, it's different. The, the one that I showed for Brazil, remember this is very early Brazil. This is like early 1600s. Brazil is founded as a colony in the 1500s. And this expression, negros da terra, blacks of this land, is something that the Portuguese made up. The names of the people who lived in the area are uh, on the coast, especially were Tupi, Tupinamba, and others, you know, as you go further into the Brazilian interior. But uh, all along the coast, those people were Tupi. So to call them negros da terra is something that the Portuguese, or let's say the Spanish and the Portuguese, are beginning to do a classification as they wish to classify people. So they're classifying them as blacks of this land. And then the ones who are coming, brought, being brought in slightly later from Africa are classified as blacks from Guinea or blacks from Angola. Those would be the two earliest for, mm -hmm. this, for this place. But you are right, these, these, your implication is that these names are mixed up, made up, and in time, uh, replace the actual names that the people call themselves. <laughs>